Hello and welcome to Keystroke Mediums, The Writer's Journey. Today, we're looking beyond ebooks, paperbacks, and audio as avenues of publication. Walt Robiat and Michael Avati are here with us today to think outside the box when it comes to publishing our stories in new formats to reach new audiences. What exactly does that look like? Find out today, right now, because we're live right now. Hello, welcome everybody, live chat, golf clap of appreciation, Corey Gilliam, Patricia Gilliam, Josh Hayes out there hanging out. What up my fellas? Walt, Mike, thank you for joining us. Good to be here. <laughs> Walt and I was on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Again, the old man. What's well, we're going glad, on, guys? Glad to see you guys. Glad you're here. And I, I have no nothing uh, that I know about, well, a little bit about tabletop gaming, but how to get my story into tabletop gaming or how to start an easing. So this will be all new content and information for me. And I'm excited to, to jump right in and like pick your brains on the subject. What's funny is Mike keeps telling me this is my fault, but I, I don't remember. It, it, it really is. Um, <laughs> all right. So. I've got a hobby horse I've been going on about, about for years. And it's, you know, one of these arguments I like to have with people. Like, you should write a novel, novel. I'm like, well, <laughs> world building is self-indulgent. Um, novels are padded. You can tell any good story in 5,000 words or you're just being lazy. And Ooh. I know it's a terrible thing to say, but I was just trained as a journalist. Sorry. I was trained as a journalist. And I, you have to accept that you have people's attention span for about this long. So you need to get to the point, say it clearly, say it well, and get out. And I had that hammer enemy for 20 years. And I'm like, now you gotta slow down, expand, talk about the silverware, talk about what they're eating. And you know, talk no, about don't talk shoes. about the silverware. We don't care about the silverware. Yeah, I don't either. I really, really don't. And, um, you know, I, uh, one time Walt and I were talking about that, and I was like, I, I don't care about the bowl of brown and King's Landing. It doesn't matter to me. And Walt was like, no, man, that's important because he went into the details and explained that that potato you could find in your bowl was all the sustenance you would need to keep you going. And, it makes a good point. It's a good world building detail. But I want to see people get whacked with swords. Well, yeah, it's, <laughs> I, I, I sometimes think that, you know, in a, especially in genre fiction where the focus is on write a novel. OK, now write three novels and now write a few more in that series. And I think sometimes that the simple pleasures, if you will, of a beautiful, concise piece of writing might be lost, you know, between um, all the emphasis on longer form, um, to put it nicely. So. And this is something I like to complain about because I'm an old man. And that's what we do when I was talking to Walt. And he was like, well, you should do a short story zine. And, you know, and I was like, well, that's a great idea. And he goes, you know what you should do is you should also put an RPG content because the White Star RPG is a lot of fun and they haven't had support for a while. And you could combine the two into this unholy alchemy of peanut butter and chocolate, you know, with fiction and what? RPG. And I know, I know. And it's, it, you know, there used to be magazines that did stuff like this, Dragon Magazine. Mm -hmm. Uh, pour one out because it's gone now. Um, they would run short fiction as well as RPG stuff that tied into it. And because um, there's a lot of crossover between those two audiences. And so that's kind of what we're aiming for with Blaster Bolts. Um, you now we're going for a very specific kind of 70s sci fi, kitschy design aesthetic and, um, uh, you know, but very short fiction. And with Walt, God bless him. We were able to tie the gaming ele elements real tightly into his stories on, on his 2L. And that was awesome. Haven't been able to do that with the other ones. Um, sometimes there, there's a tonal alignment, but his is the I only one. I came close with Jason's. He came close, yeah. Um, with Jason Sunday and Walt, they did a Doom homage. Uh, and Walt's story was very close to a Doom situation. And Jason's adventure was very close to that kind of, you know, space marines fighting demons from portals kind of stuff. So, um, uh, we would like to have more of an overlap, but some of the editorial challenges of getting game designers to work closely with writers and get those two things to happen, you know, while you're working day jobs and raising kids and dealing with dogs, it's, it can be a lot. So um, in the future, I'd like to do that. But that's that was our vision. That's what we set out to do. And we have uh, 11 um, issues out now. So it's been going pretty strong for the last couple of months. We've been doing weekly or bi-weekly releases. And uh, I feel like I'm talking a lot right now, so I'm going to stop. So <laughs> one of you people no, can you're ask good. questions. No, you're good. Yeah. It, sounds, it sounds really cool because, it, I mean, you're right. There has been a lot of focus on the long form of writing. You know, because as authors, that's kind of where the money is at, mm -hmm. or at least where it's been most easily found. And I say that loosely. 
you know, because you catch reader with that first book and then you get the second, third. And if it goes well, you don't want to stop a good thing while it's going. So you write a fourth and an eighth and a 29th and that just keeps going. But at the same time for, you know, those that you are just starting with your series who have series that are going, have long winded series that you've just, you know, closed out. You, know, you could take those side characters, you could take those extra moments in between what was written. And, you know, like you're doing, Mike, uh, even even submitting to Mike, having this uh, crossover with the shorter, tighter form of story and, you know, merge that into this game aspect. And uh, that that sounds very intriguing to me. You know, like it was actually a pretty cool collaboration in the beginning because, you know, Mike, uh, you know, we, we got to talking about it and uh he's like he's like well do you have anything i said well you know i have um uh my hunter's moon universe that uh that we published and uh um you know i, I kind of wanted to have all facets of that be accessible to people so like um uh, i had this idea for a short story um uh and uh Mike was like, you know, well, I could put it in the magazine. And I said, well, you know, that's kind of cool. Cause like with White Star, White Star, for those who don't know, is an old school game that's been reskinned to kind of be like that wars in the stars that, so, you know, Disney took over not too long ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but the serial numbers are totally filed off, like totally. totally. And, and, uh, so I said, you know something, I bet you I could, I could do these short stories uh, in White Star super easy. So um, yeah, we did it. And uh, he, I, I, I call him up one night and, and I'm like, all right, so what are we talking here? Uh, and he said, you know, and I'm thinking I, I submitted a couple of short stories for anthologies and stuff. And usually 6,000 to 10,000 words is usually the standard, some of the stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, um, he was like, yeah, 4,000 words. I'm like, 4,000 words. <laughs> Sorry. I'm like, bruh. I said, I just finished cracking my knuckles at 4,000 words. He's like, no, no, that's what I need, 4,000 words. I'm like, I'm sorry. I, 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 I've since expanded. I, I'm not doing longer <laughs> stories. I'm sorry. Walt, Walt had to be the canary in the coal mine writing. This it's okay. Really, yeah. It was a great exercise because uh, um, uh, for writers who are used to a very long prose and um, you know, getting that every detail squeezed out of your brain and onto the page so that the writer, uh, so that the reader has enough to imagine and fantasize what you're describing, but not so much that he, the, the reader can't put in their own details. It was really an exercise in, in that, in, in that tight balance of don't put anything extraneous in there. Make sure you use extraneous somewhere in the, in the manuscript yeah. <laughs> and then, and then get that good balance of just enough description just enough left open so that the reader makes the story their own and uh it was it was a neat exercise and then uh um one of the uh the benefits was uh white star was written by a guy named james spawn and james uh uh yes thank you leo for those that don't know leo's piling onto his wife's account um so um uh yeah but uh the the what do you call it uh well no i don't think that's his wife's account no claire's his first name is Claire really his first name? It's yep. a boy's name. I do. I've just outed him right on the internet. I love it. <laughs> you know, I really wanted a tougher name. I told my mother when I was coming up, uh, I, you know, Walter wasn't tough enough. I wanted something like Alice or Marion. Um, she wouldn't go for I it. I see you being a Marion. Uh, yeah. I mean, look at Sylvester Stallone, Marion Cobretti in the movie Cobra. Uh, are, we Cobra. are we dancing around a boy called Sue joke here? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the, the tight storytelling uh, uh, limited to a certain word count really, really pushed you to get as much story out of the words you were laying down rather than just padding your word word count to get that extra length. So it, it was a, it was a really great exercise. And like I said, James Spawn came in and was like, you know, I bet you I could make up some space dwarves. <laughs> I was like, cool. Uh, so yeah, that was that was cool. So yeah, we had a lot of extra content because uh, I've produced content for the game. Mike has produced yeah. content for the game. Uh, James, obviously the creator of the game, came in and produced content. So it just made yeah. a really cool marriage. We got lucky because James kind of had a backlog of articles he was going to publish, and then he kind of um, stopped publishing. And we were like, can we have all that stuff? <laughs> are you gonna eat that sir and we, he said no we could and he, we bought it for a song and so yeah we've been uh, kind of expanding the you know the basic rule set with content from the system creator which was a nice bonus and unexpected so that's been yeah cool. but i mean this all ties into stuff like um 
uh, like behind me. I don't know if you can you can see my dolls, Josh. Josh, your <laughs> dolls. Um, but um, The Witcher, right? Uh, Polish writer did an amazing job of conveying the world. Uh, <laughs> um, did an amazing job of conveying the world of The Witcher and of uh, Geralt of Rivia. Um, and a Polish video game company came up named CD, uh, CD Project, And they said, this is amazing. We'll do a game. Um, and the games are as immersive and as colorful as the stories. They did a, an amazing job of like squeezing every ounce of blood out of those pages uh, to get into those games. And there, it, it's got a massive following. But that's another avenue where, you know, writers who... <laughs> <laughs> collectibles yes josh but that's another avenue of uh of having um your uh your writing cross into another genre you know not just role-playing games but video games uh you know obviously tv movies you know we see that all the time but um uh a, a great novel done or a great short story like mike has been seeing in the in the e-zine um are, is just rife for the picking for um uh, material for the for the game table so yeah very very cool and wrapping back to the easing i am i've been staring at this i have been mike i've been staring at it waiting for a time to click okay add to stream because we have here i'm assuming this is one of the covers of the it blaster is. bolts yeah. science fiction zine so for you pros of you if i could talk right over on the uh audio end in our podbean uh yeah you need to get over to the youtube and check around take a look minute at this. 14 this is, yeah because this is gorgeous this is a gorgeous little cover i love, the, I love, love the retro feel yes. and yeah. I, I like the extra i like the extra um the effort with the like it looks it looks like a like a toy that you know just got ripped off the, the shelf and there's like the old school tag you know kind of stained and yeah it's just been hanging around for a while i love that yeah a guy named je shields um did both the uh trade dress design for us as well as that specific image is one of his so um got real lucky uh, he was willing to help us out on that um i've got a bunch of covers i can cycle through them if you want yes yeah, let's see we love seeing pretty things cycle okay. cycle <laughs> i have got let me share specifically this is the one for i'm going to stop sharing and then share again this is the image for uh walt's first story and we like this one because it's got robotic samurai and he doesn't <laughs> like robotic uh, samurai can never go wrong there samurai. Uh, the other thing I love about this is uh, uh, our good friend uh, Joe Singleton did mm. the artwork for that, and he, he he was an amazing artist who has since passed away. But uh, every time I look at that that cover, I just uh, mm. I, I go goofy. I love that cover. Yeah, and this is uh, Tango Dreams. Is a am I saying Tango right, Walt? Uh, yep. Yep. Okay. It, it's a great story. It's a lot of fun, and it's 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 this girl fighting against space pirates who finds this cast off security droid who's you know is kind of a samurai, and it's Oh boy, I I wish Netflix was calling Walt right now to negotiate the rights. It would just be huge. It was a really fun story to write because in the story, like uh, like the image that you're seeing here was meant for later on in her career where she's more grown up. But basically, um, her family is kidnapped by pirates. Um, he rescues or tries to rescue her in the uh, in the you know where they've ended up, um, and ends up raising her uh, as his own. You know, so she becomes basically like this this samurai prodigy, you know. Um, and, and he's it, a robot. And he's, he's a, a robot. robot. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So he's cool. he's just yeah, uh, you know. And it's this uh, uh, really nice blend of of almost like lone wolf and cub, and uh, you know, I am human. Um, and it it just has it, it it just I really enjoyed writing that story. You know, hmm. I really enjoyed that because. Um, as a uh, as a fish out of water, you know, somebody who's, you know, um, I, I, I don't have like I can't just say that I have this family from this place and I'm related to these people. You know, I'm a Heinz 57 human. So like being in a, <laughs> right. Right. So being with uh, being, you know, uh, that fish out of water, uh, but having somebody to still say it doesn't matter. You're beautiful to me. You know, that's that's that i love that story and you know it's a robot fighting pirates with <laughs> with a little girl on his back who did who would be into now. that you know what i mean it's just awesome you know so yeah i really enjoyed writing that story i can click through some of the rest of these if you'd like yeah, yeah. do it yeah. 
All right. Uh, oh, uh, this one is by, um, I got to make sure I get the name right. Hang on one second. Um, first name, Althea, and I'm working on the last name. Uh, but it's, um, you know, the cover design was by Jacob Blackman. Jacob, I hope you're watching. Uh, you Jacob, does good work. Hmm. He does good work. Um, this was a lady who I believe was some kind of prospector. and uh, But a lot of it borrows heavily from uh, some Latin, uh, you know, uh, folklore. And uh, just a really cool story. It looks like a merge between like a like a Western type folky story with space because you got that cool looking ship in the background. Yeah, yeah. hell yeah, uh, Althea Seals. That that's her name. Um, so that was cool. Uh, this one, Outlaw. Let me look up the right. We got one of the guys who done some writing on Star Trek novels. Did this one, and this was just a straight up space western. Once again, art by Jacob uh, Blackman. Um, let me pull that one up just real fast. Um, that was one of two guys. Um, one this one's really cool in its simplicity because it's it's you've got the hat, you've got that nice bright light to draw your eye with the coins and the space looking western gun. I like it. <laughs> Only thing we're missing is a deck of cards. Oh yeah. And each Sometimes of these covers has that 80s nostalgia feel with the yeah. the font. And as Peter Nealon pointed out, there's even like a, a faded price tag on it. It just takes it straight back. Um, yeah, you know, our, our print on demand vendor had a problem with that. And we were like, well, you know, it's, it's an aesthetic choice. It's really clearly not the actual price tag because there is no store called Xmart. <laughs> some of these. Wow. Our, yeah, print on demand. We had to have an argument with them about that because they're like, well, we can't have that. It's, it's misleading about the price tag. And I'm like, do they think wow. it's also a action figure package? Because that's what it's designed <laughs> yeah. too. That's, a, that's another thing. Um, just popped in my head um with the you know this cross platform you know you have your ebook you have your paperback and your audio and then you're like hey what about a um a comic book or the other graphic novel mm -hmm. uh tabletop game um things like that is the cohesiveness of the word that just left my brain um do y'all know what i'm talking about the the, the stuff the god Damn it. <laughs> uh, the, I had a good point. Um, no, the, it's, it's, you, uh, the multimedia vision. It, uh, yeah, all around that. The, no, there's a word for it. And now I feel like an idiot just babbling. Oh. Transmedia. Uh, so does does the does the uh, media you're crossing into like your hold... logos and stuff? <laughs> brand. Oh, the, the branding. Yeah, the brand. Yeah. Yes, your branding. It's all branded. So even though these are all different stories, the the images within the branding of you know that that old school price tag and the um uh toy looking cartridge you know it's all it's all branded so that's definitely something you have to keep in mind when you're cross-platforming is what is it about the whole of your story that can carry across as that brand so that when someone sees this card game they're like oh my god i love that book and they're yeah. like oh wait book I played it, I read it as a graphic novel. And we're like, well, we need to play the game and be awesome. And then you're going to have little miniature characters. And it's just mm. great. And it's awesome. So definitely keeping in mind that brand. Thank God that word came back to me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lauren. Um, yeah, this was um, yes, uh, important. Michael Jan Friedman. Uh, he's been writing for Image, Marvel Comics, and a lot of licensed Star Trek novels. He's been on the New York Times bestseller list. And he, uh, somehow... Uh, we charmed him into writing for us, and this was just a great little space western he did. So uh, that was a fun story. And let's see. Oh, God. Oh, that Mel John Givens cover. Yeah. Oh, Mel John. Mel Todd is a cool writer, and she was uh, nice enough to do this for us. Once again, kind of a space western. And our friend from across the pond, John Gibbons, did this art. And um, I can't do it justice for those of you listening on the audio, but um, yeah, just a, it's a cool, cool piece. And um, yeah, I, we, been pretty honed in on the space western kind of vibe because that's sort of what we were going for mm -hmm. looking at the trade dress you can probably guess that but um yeah that was issue 10 that was out a couple weeks ago a lot of fun um kind of like the the oh boy what was that john wayne movie it's a rescue story i'm trying to think of that one the searchers um but you know set in an afternoon um let me see once again i feel like i'm talking too much sorry this is no. the doom homage that uh what was talking about that he and Jason Sunday put together, which uh, is funny too because uh, Lauren's actually read it. Oh, um, okay. We submitted it. I submitted it to the space opera anthology that ah. uh, 
that um, uh, Keystroke Medium was doing a few years ago. And uh, they were like, we like it. This is military science fiction. We can't put this in a space opera thing. So mm -hmm. it was, it was, yeah, that was, that was cool. So we just repurposed it and, and, and now Mike has it in the blaster bolts. Yeah. Yeah. And at least gave me more than, you know, 4,000 words on that one. <laughs> <laughs> and another, gonna... and another point to don't always, don't throw out your words. Just because yeah. it might yeah. not work somewhere, you can exactly as Walt said, you can repurpose it into something else. Hold on to it. Something will come up. Yeah, words. I did read it and we did e editing feedback, which is one cool thing mm -hmm. about like these magazines is you can get feedback quick and you can yeah. respond to it. You can uh, make changes if you want, um, but hopefully that made that story a little better. And it, was, yeah, it was very tight. Very takes, tight. It, takes it to the next level with blaster bolts. So, yeah, that was pretty cool. I love <laughs> I love the old we, ads. We put a lot of fake toy ads in back just to kind of. It's sort of our not seen on TV. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. And uh, if you're a guy in his 40s or 50s, you might remember there is a specific incident with the Battlestar Galactica toys where some poor kid lost an eye. So that's why mm -hmm. I mentioned these shatterproof eye goggles that come with those. Yeah. <laughs> so, and those next, are all oh. such fun touches. Yeah. Oh, David Bednarski. Um, this is a Pony Express story. Um, Boy, I need to find the author's name because she works for Paizo and she's a great writer. Um, but this is this, uh, a couple of Pony Express writers on Alien World uh, running away from this, you know, uh, one of these horrible storms you hear about, like on, you know, Venus or something where it's raining sulfuric acid. And uh, wow. Yeah, David Bednarski was the author, sorry, the artist. And um, just look at that amazing work. He's a scientist during the day, but man, he does some amazing, uh, amazing, amazing work for us. And I like, let me get the author's yeah. name. Sorry, I don't have the memory I used to have when I was a younger man. There's um, darkness. I think, we've, I think I've made it very clear that none of us have the memory we used to. No. <laughs> Kendra, Kendra Lay Speeding, uh, Speedling. She does work for Paizo. Uh, I think she's one Another of the game company on Starfinder right now. Yeah. And um, oh boy, just an amazing writer and just a really, really fun story. And I want to say that was issue three or four. That's Walt's cover for the second one. Ah, this is the one that just came out on Monday. Uh, this is my story. Uh, well, <laughs> Grant the Knight. Grant the Knight. <laughs> once again, that is art by David Bednarski. And um, you can probably get an idea what we're homaging. Homaging? Is that a verb? I have Here. no idea, Mike. Whatever yeah. would that be? It is now. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, for authors, uh, we can make up words. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. So I started off this story, The Easy Job. Um, Kind of wanted to do a, uh, I don't want to say a parody, but uh, maybe a, let's call it a parody for lack of a better word. Kind of like what John Scalzi did with Red Shirts, but I got on Bounty Hunters. Um, I was having trouble getting into the headspace like the Mandalorian or Boba Fett, so I wound up running for something about, well, what if that one daring smuggler who likes to wear vests and his large hirsute compatriot were Bounty Hunters, and what would that so it, it's uh, I do a lot of send ups of some Star Wars elements here and there and uh, a lot of fun to write. And it just came out. And oh, my God, look at that cover that Bednarski did for us. So and, and uh, on and digging into all these stories, all these great stories and these covers are just it makes you want to read them all um, for for our audience out there who might be like, hey, I might want to make a magazine. I might want to do this easy thing and pull in not just my stories but others potentially or you know what have you what really goes into creating this magazine like what sort of steps are people potentially going to have to look at in diving into such a deep ended pool um well let's just focus on the fiction side because uh working with the rpg thing is a whole other uh whole other ball of wax um I guess my work in journalism kind of prepared me just for the workflow. Um, but you guys put together anthologies, so you're probably used to it. Um, you know, there's a stage where you get get a lot of submissions, and Walt helped us out. He's got, I want to say, three or four stories. No, three stories in our first run of issues. Um, you know, you, you read for content. You read for tone. Um, you try to give notes where you have to give notes. Um, if it doesn't fit, you say, sorry, it doesn't quite fit. Um, had a guy submit a really fun heist story, but we were specifically aiming for space westerns and his was more space oceans 11 and we just couldn't use it and you hate to say no mm -hmm. but you want to you want to stay on theme um so that um we've done basic editing you know just kind of you know make it look right um 
and layout. Um, if you don't know how to do it, make a friend who knows how to do it. Uh, Walt <laughs> has done layout for me in the past. These ones specifically, I have a guy named Craig Williams, another lovely British person um, across the pond who uh, cranks them out pretty quickly. And once you get the format for the first few issues, it's pretty easy to plug, plug in the articles, which is how we did it back in the days of you know working in a weekly newspaper or whatever. You get your general template and you plug your stories in and um, rearrange the ads, or in our case, our fake humorous ads as mm -hmm. you need to. And um, kind of just been doing it as a passion project because it was something I wanted to see out there in the world. I, you know, wanted to see a venue for short stories and I've enjoyed creating it and reading them and writing the few that I've written. Um, we're not making much money on it. Um, we are planning on funneling into a Kickstarter uh, here in a month or two. I should probably get on that. And <laughs> yeah, I hear they're a beast, a beast yeah. to, to do. Yeah. Yeah. So the. The idea is, hey, you enjoyed these short stories? Well, now we're going to put them all into a you know compendium. And um, we've had a lot of requests to split out the fiction and the RPG content into super, two, two separate books, mainly because the people who want a game don't want to flip through stories when they're looking up you know gaming material. So um, yeah, so we'll send emails to everyone who's bought a copy over on Drive Through RPG or Drive Through Fiction and say, hey, do you like our stuff? Well, hey, here's a Kickstarter link and try to fund it from there and hopefully we can recoup some of the uh, production costs at that point but uh yeah that's that's the basic recipe uh the biggest challenges have been you know um art and game content and layout so um if you're focusing just on fiction you're going to eliminate one of those obstacles right off the bat um, now say we have an author who's thinking of like submitting to you guys mm -hmm. um they might have a short story that's connected with a series that they've written already <laughs> or are planning on writing. Uh, what kind of creative rights are signed over or not signed over by your magazine? Um, we get one time publication and after that, everything reverts back to you. I mean, we get one time electronic and then, you know, when we do the, the Kickstarter, but um, um, we've even done, uh, boy, I'm trying to remember the guy, Terry Mixon, uh, J.R. Hanley hooked us up with yeah. him. Um, he had a great story called Warfish, which was more of a war story, but man, it was good. And we were so lucky to get it. And so we, we ran that and it's been previously published in anthologies. So we just got, you know, second or third publication rights and um, just ran with that. Uh, but yeah, just hit me up. I'm Fanning Goat Games on um, either Twitter or Facebook. I'm pretty easy to find. Uh, we've kind of wrapped up this round. Like I say, we're funneling towards a crowdfunding campaign. Um, We'll probably be doing series two, season two, um, Blaster Bolt Strikes Back, whatever we're going to call it sometime in 2023. So if you got some stories, uh, we're probably going to still be kind of aiming for a space Western sort of vibe. So um, this time we'll be going with a more generous, you know, six to 10K word count uh, just to make Walt happy. No, mm -hmm. next time I'm turning in two, I'm going to razor blade this stuff. <laughs> Walt's going to do like instant fiction, <laughs> like mini shorts. Um, but yeah, I here is why this is a great opportunity for people to think about. And we didn't leverage it as well as we could have. RPGs are huge right now. Uh, you know, Hasbro is a big company, but Wizards of the Coast, who makes D&D, is bigger than the rest of Hasbro. Um, they're making, you know, it's, you know, between. They've got, all, they've got the market. Oh, yeah. They, they've got the market. Uh, streaming shows. Uh, et cetera. It's got a huge, huge amount of market right now. And if you could find a way, if I were a smarter man, I would do a fantasy anthology or a fantasy zine and tie in 5e gaming content related to those stories. Um, because I think that would be a gold mine for someone who could market it right. Um, I'm not that smart and I really like science fiction. Um, so I'm not going to do that, but Honestly, I think that idea is just waiting out there for, you know, someone who wants to jump on it. And there's so many streaming shows who I think you could even, you know, talk to them. And I mean, you're not going to get critical role to say, yeah, sure, we'll write you a short story. But there's so many folks out there with, you know, large followings. You could probably, you know, leverage some of their audience base and get some of their folks to contribute some material. And I think it's a, I think it's a big opportunity. Um, if I were someone who wrote more fantasy, I would be looking at doing something like that. But, um, you know, that is a really interesting uh, point that I don't know if you realize that you made because in, in the long fiction, <laughs> in the long fiction publication side, fantasy is really hard to sell. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it, it's, you've got longer, longer words, 100, 200,000 K novels. And the audience for whatever reason is large, but not large in the scale of people 
getting it up ravishingly, not like, you know, a lot of the sci-fi markets and of course the romance markets. So for you to be like, well, fantasy is hot in this table, uh, in the table, God, if I can't, can't talk in my tabletop, tabletop gaming, there we go. Um, and you know, like those easings and tying that in, that's interesting because, you know, for, for all those fantasy authors might be something worth, you know, taking a look at. And, um, it, the point I'm making as I'm rambling is all of these different platforms are all going to have their benefits um, and their strengths towards different uh, genres that you re that you write in. So definitely researching that and taking advantage of where your readers are also finding their content um, is, is a good way to go. Yeah. So how do you take a short story and turn it into a tabletop game? Like, what does that look like? Well, um, I know for one of Walt's stories, um, like his first one, uh, it's set in a starship graveyard. And um, okay. do you, do you want to bring that up, Mike, so they can see what the what some of the elements look like? How about you talk about it while I desperately search for the map? I am going to do that. <laughs> okay. So um, uh, one of the things that you can do is tie it into a game that somebody's already running, right? So like, if say you got somebody like Mike was talking about that's already doing Dungeons and Dragons, which is the big. 500 pound gorilla in the room um you know you could you could write that story and use the elements from that game so that you're not technically creating an entire game to go in the back of this magazine you're just giving elements the best example i usually give to people when they ask about tabletop rpgs and how they work imagine you have you bought your base video game for like 60 bucks right is what they usually go for now a little bit more maybe right you buy your base video game and then down the road, somebody builds a um, an enhancement for it. So like a new batch of levels, a new character you can play, so forth and so on. You then download that part of the game. It becomes part of the game you already own. And then boom, there you go, right? Tabletop role-playing games work pretty much the same way. You have the base game that you're already that you already have and are already playing. And say you take this the story like uh, the story like uh, that I wrote. It takes place in a space graveyard. Right. Uh, it's, it's all like broken down starships and stuff like that. Um, so Mike brought in um, it was Jacob that did that. Right. The, the, yes. Jacob Blackman. Yeah. Who is also in the chat, by the way. Um, hey, and, Jacob. He's good people. He does great work. Yeah. He's 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 so oh my God. Such a great dude. Um, but yeah, so he brought in Jacob uh, uh, and did the map. So now you have a physical representation or like a, a, you know, a visual representation of the area that the story takes place in. Right. You can use the game to create characters to play through that story, just like you experienced from reading it. Uh, we included the characters from the story. So if you wanted to try and recreate that, um, recreate that at your table uh, with a couple of people. So there are the character sheets for it. Right. So, um, so you have, pretty. <laughs> yeah, you have the characters right there and they're all statted up to use for the game. Um, uh, the great thing about the, the White Star game that we used is you can get it on uh, Drive Through RPG, which is uh, the local e-tailer for all the big RPGs. You can get it for like 10 bucks. Uh, and he usually has uh, routine sales on the older version of the game uh, to give it to you for free. So, um, you know, you take these characters and almost like those choose an adventure book from back in the day when we were younger. Yes. Right? You set up the story just like it was when it at the very beginning, you basically set up the table the way it was right at the beginning of the story and uh, let your players play through it so that they, uh, you know, you could come with a totally different outlook. You know, there's nothing saying that the little girl doesn't run off and join the pirates, you know, or, <laughs> you know, the samurai becomes the pirate king or, you know, any number of things can happen that can take that story in a billion different directions. But you're basically using that story as a uh, uh, just like a movie it takes mm. comic books. Um, a lot of comic book movies are uh, come from instead of doing huge storyboards, they storyboard right from the uh, right from the comic itself, because that's basically what a comic is. It's a it's a paneled out scene for scene basically script for a movie <laughs> so yeah. and these <laughs> yeah and these magazines are, are pretty much the same way you know and uh at the end of this particular issue uh mike was was diligent in making sure that you had everything you needed to plug this right into the game it was for and now you can play out that adventure at your table yeah and we just in this case it was like uh, three or four pages of additional content uh the step blocks for the bad guys step blocks for the heroes here's a map 
here's a couple of adventure hooks uh, for Walt sequel in the second issue we did um it was a full adventure you know so five or six pages the map of the space station they were on descriptions of all the rooms descriptions of all the enemies so a little bit more in depth but you know the same basic idea but um it's worth pointing out that rpgs are really hot right now and there's even like big ip owners um boy four or five years ago wendy's came out with a kind of a joke rpg but it was, yeah, that was pages long lavishly illustrated and the idea was to build brand awareness and keep people engaged in hate to say engaged in your brand because it sound like a horrible douchebag but yeah it's <laughs> No, so, man, that's that's exactly yeah. like, you know, that if you yeah. if you can't keep people engaged in, you know, what you're well, setting down, they're not going to step. Well, let me uh, be part of it. Just an hour ago, Jacob and I over on my podcast, the band podcast, we interviewed a guy from Evil Genius Games, lovely fellow. They're doing a Kickstarter for a game called uh, Everyday Heroes. Oh, my God. A, a <laughs> modern modern day variant on 5e. The reason I mentioned it on this show is they are doing gaming content for Pacific Rim. Uh, Escape from New York, Highlander, uh, the, the Crow, uh, boy, Universal Soldier, Total Recall. And, you know, these are all old, older IPs, some of them. Some of them are quite new. But the rights holders want to keep the audience engaged in some way. And um, this is a way, you know, some of your hard, there's a lot of Highlander fans in the RPG space. And, hey, here's, you know, here's a way to keep them engaged. There's a lot of Universal Soldier fans, believe it or not, in the RPG space. And, uh you know, they take a rule set very similar to the most popular one, the Innocent Dragons 5e, put a modern spin on it. And it's a way for them to reach their fans, a uh, different avenue, and, you know, tell stories in that world that keep your fans interested and engaged in the IP. So I think there's a lot of opportunities out there if you're savvy and smart about how you market it and how you approach that audience. Um, and like I said, we're, we're kind of just doing it for a goof here and for fun because it's something we wanted to see in the world. Um, I think think if you were a writer looking to be savvy and grow your fan base there's a lot of opportunities here if you uh you know took the right avenues and thought about you know how you're getting those people you have to look at your words so and it's yeah. really interesting too going back to what mike was saying about uh interacting with an ip um uh a lot of people don't realize um one of the the biggest uh, one of the biggest proponents of keeping Star Wars alive in the 1990s and early 2000s before the next round of movies came out because yeah. there was no movies that were going to be planned. They, they didn't have anything. But a company named West End Games came in and uh, asked Lucasfilm for the rights to produce a Star Wars role-playing game. And for years, they were pumping out content. And like now, if you go to try and find those old books, they run for hundreds of dollars like on eBay and stuff like that. Because at the time, nobody was putting out any Star Wars content. And they were doing it religiously and engaging that audience and basically dragging an entire audience, kicking and screaming into tabletop role-playing games. Wow. So, I mean, you know, linking back to there's there's precedent for this and um, to have a magazine like this that not only uh, allows us to get some short fiction into people's hands uh, and enjoy the short fiction we might not have noticed otherwise, but it also lets us play it at the game table, which uh, a lot of us from from that era back in the day that were dragged kicking and screaming into into rolling dice across the table and <laughs> worrying about pizza stains on character sheets, you know, that that that's that's you know like like gold for us you know to have yeah. something like this so it's really cool yeah just a weird trivia fact and sparky pointed this out in the comments uh there's an almost comical amount of star wars world building that wasn't done by guys in hollywood were done by the guy writing the star wars rpg back in the 80s and 90s i mean like the names yep there he goes uh the names of all the alien species that came out of the rpg yeah just as he says weg was a foundation expanded universe um a lot of the plot lines a lot of the world building they never did in the movies they did in the rpgs yeah because like in the scripts um like uh if you've recently watched uh, uh the book of boba fett um there's an authorian as the mayor right and uh, that came out of the rpg from the 90s before that it was only listed in the script as hammerhead that's it <laughs> That, mm. that, that's all that alien was called. And later on, the guys who wrote the Star Wars RPG came in and gave a name to that alien, an actual race name. And it, uh, it you know, it developed all this lore that made sense of why they looked like that, you know, mm. which was really, really cool. Well, Mike, you said that back in the 80s, you know, role playing was huge. And, you know, in this moment, 
right now in, in 2022, we might be seeing a similar moment where people want to connect. They're mm -hmm. tired of being stuck in their houses and they want to get out with friends. And the nice thing about uh, RPGs is that you can play this over the internet and get a core group of group core group of friends from your local area or from all over the world. And now that we're actually like able to leave our houses and take off our masks and be in the same room together, we can play this in person. I've been playing D and D for the first time in my life um, the past few months, just because we want to get together and to do something. Um, mm -hmm. So I can see authors being able to, to create character sheets very quickly and easily as a freebie to send mm -hmm. out in their newsletter. And then uh, people can have fun jumping into the world of their stories and playing together. If that's something that interests them. Uh, yeah, Walt and I, sorry, go ahead. No, please you. Walt and I, we both uh, work for Galaxy's Edge and how much fun would it be to be jumping into a Galaxy's Edge book and playing one of the characters and some scenario that Nick and Jason came up with and actually interacting with that fresh new hook. Well, the the thing is, and, and if you're a Galaxy's Edge insider or you're someone who listens to the podcast regularly, um, uh, I have the RPG. It's done. Ooh. Yes. Dun, dun, dun. The only the only thing we need to add is uh, art and layout. So, ah. it's already been on the table, so, waiting to be unfolded. Yeah, I mean it's it's you know I have to uh, I have a responsibility to first uh, finish and deliver the Forgotten Ruin role playing game uh, that we kickstarted uh, about two months ago. So, um, but yeah, I mean stuff like that, you know. Um, uh, I have a game system that I own. Um, uh, it's called the Super Six system, and very easy. You can learn to play in five minutes. Uh, Mike has been very gracious with his own podcast, the Banff Podcast, and and has had uh, numerous play tests of my system on repeatedly. Uh, and it's it's just one of those things that's super easy and makes for a quick, uh, fun representation of any genre. And uh, uh, you know, using an uh Galaxy's Edge role playing game was a no brainer for us. Yeah, I think it struggles with some of the Bronte sisters, like Regency Romance, but pretty much any other <laughs> genre. Oh, uh, no. My brother picked up a, a one-shot D&D uh, &D session. It's set in a fantasy world, and it's set around something like a Jane Austen novel. I saw so, that. It's from um, um, it's from D&D &D Beyond. We're going to get all my girlfriends together who've never played D&D &D together. We're going to oh, introduce them and go to town. It'll be fun. Yeah. Uh, I... <laughs> There you I, go. There's the crossover. No one knew was coming. Exactly. Romance. <laughs> it's Game. Oh. Tabletop. They, Play it. They, <laughs> a couple of months ago, they did a Harry Potter cozy coffee shop crossover for D and D. What? And I was like, not for me, but I can see how some people would be into it. Yeah, there's there's whole rules for running a game just where you're running your own coffee shop or running your own bar. I mean, there's all okay. kind. If you want low stakes, you know that's. That's legit. People might want to something, yeah. you know, just mellow. That's that's fine too. But you know, there was that trend a few years ago where they were taking old novels and injecting, you know, Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, for example, just comes to mind. And yes. Yeah, you can RPG the heck out of that. So hey, oh, JR yeah. Hanley's in the comments. How you doing, JR? How you doing? With his dress that he's gonna fight for. <laughs> <laughs> he has to fight Becky to the death. How dare she wear the same dress as JR? <laughs> All right. So real quick, because we're mm -hmm getting near the three-fourth mark of mm -hmm. this this delight that could probably go on a lot longer but spotlight i'm just gonna jump in i'm just gonna mm -hmm. say it is on blaster bolts an easy that features both short fiction and material for white star white box science fiction role playing so why an easy that focuses on short stories because short fiction is awesome since the era of the pulps, many of the legendary writers of the fantasy and science fiction genres developed their skills of skills writing short fiction. But there's a dearth of good venues for short fiction these days, and novels, well, let's be honest, series of novels that dominate the genre. While everyone in genre fiction has been busy publishing their series of novels with all their exposition and all their world building, the simple pleasures of a focused and concise piece of writing seems to have been lost. Put another way, Blaster Bolts really enjoys short science fiction and they aren't seeing much of it out there anymore. So they wanted to create a venue, a fun retro stylish venue that didn't take itself too, too seriously. That's 
blaster bolts. Got some linkages to the first and the most recent issue uh, featuring a story by Walt Robillard and Mike Lafferty. Check it out, get involved, and also uh, taking a peek at these sorts of things might just give you ideas even if you didn't want to do like a whole easing thing, you know, you could do like a one shot, like little uh, 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 one page thing that you could send out to your newsletters mm -hmm. that you could put on all of your different social medias. Um, and that might be really cool. You know, maybe maybe your readers out there want to play your romance characters or your badass military sci fi people or your anamorphic cats and werewolves and who knows who knows maybe that's for you check it out that's awesome you know something while you were just talking it just struck my brain how cool would it be to take like a cozy mystery character and thrust them into like something like the gray man <laughs> novels and have them be go. like totally out of their element <laughs> that would be awesome but the villain's not supposed to be this evil they're terrorists shoot them oh i hate guns <laughs> <laughs> that would make for a good game at the table too we love you too jr Aww. we do and and that brings up an interesting uh, brings up an interesting thing walt because i personally love when um, completely different IPs, completely different genres do this mashup and it's just, it's glorious. It's just, I absolutely love it to pieces. And, you know, to have the opportunity to, you know, take these different um, slices of awesome and like thrust them together and force them to interact with each other. Um, and then you're a part of that. I think that could be really fun to do. Yeah, absolutely. The, uh, um, I, I have a morbid, uh, love affair with Pacific Rim, uh, giant monsters fighting giant robots. I was just like, this, <laughs> this was made specifically for me and I love it, <laughs> you know? And it's just one of those it, stuff like that is amazing. Or, uh, um, uh, like Blade Runner, you know, that, that deep, dark noir world of like depression and whatever, and then throw in like sci-fi elements questioning what it means to be humanity. I mean, that yes. was, that was really dope back in the day, you know, amazing imagery. So yeah, definitely like mix, mixing and mashing genres are, is, is absolutely awesome. Uh, I swear one day I'm going to uh, create a character who's an alien zombie cowboy ninja, but Do it hasn't it. happened. It hasn't happened yet. <laughs> So, uh, uh, I got, I got other stuff I got to get to first. All right, everybody. You heard it here. It's on the back burner sometime in the future. <laughs> Alien zombie cowboy ninjas say that five times fast. So well, as, as an author who, who's published and you've also published in short stories, you've also worked as an editor with authors. Um, what kind of author out there might be considering, uh, publishing in an easing? Like what could they get out of? that experience well one of the things you're getting with easings that you might not or having your story in an easing that you might not get um in or an easing like this mm -hmm. let, let me let me be more specific something uh, that benefits you uh to submitting to an easing like this is that um your story isn't competing with anybody else you're in there by yourself it's your story then the gaming material, then whatever other material the, the magazine has. But for that issue, you're the star, right? So That's people get cool. to focus on your issue. And, and the other thing, too, is the, the, the replay value of your story, when it's connected to the gaming material in the back, right, engages that reader to go back through your story and maybe look for things they didn't see the first time. You know, we've we've heard we've heard about like Josh Hayes and some of the stuff he puts in. If you look at like Jason and uh, and Nick of Galaxy's Edge, um, we're seeing now in season two seeds they laid in season one. And if yeah. you do, if you enjoy stuff like that as an author, um, and, and putting those little things that people might not have caught that first time when they're reading the game material and and setting up for the game that day and being like, now what did those space dwarves who came up after the pirates say? What was that thing? And they might st spend another 10, 12 minutes with your story that they didn't spend the first time. 
and notice something completely different. So for that one issue, you are the star. And because, and if it's linked to the game material in the back, it gives you replay value for that story that might further engage that reader and say, you know, I really liked that samurai and his, and his buddy uh, story. I really enjoyed that. Let me find what else this, this crazy guy wrote. And it might lead to not only somebody who really enjoys your work, but, you know, further, uh, you know, a beta reader or whatever value you get from that, you, for that one issue, you're the rock star, you're the guy. Now, the other side of that is for that one issue, you're the guy. So yeah, yeah. you better make sure that your story rise, you know, but that's where somebody like Mike comes in and says, you know, I don't think Jane Austen in space works for us right now, but, um, you know, so it, it's one of those things where um, it has its bonuses and minuses. Yeah. So, Mike, how do you get that story up to, like, rock star level then on the editor's side? <laughs> the Jane Austen in space? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. How, how would you get Jane Austen? <laughs> you know, someone out there can write an awesome Jane Austen. It's, honestly, that's you can see that in the world of Dune, right? Um, yeah. Courtly, courtly politics and the comedy yeah. of manners. And, um, um, you know, Lauren, I would not presume to ref <laughs> lecture you about the editorial process. I understand you're kind yeah. of an ace in that world. So, um, but yeah, like it, it, for Blaster Bolts, I'm just trying to stay on tone. And our, you know, our tone is pretty simple, the, you know, narrowly defined. And that's kind of the idea behind zines in general. And I would be amiss if I didn't say, Zines were a big deal in RPGs back in the 70s and 80s when people were first doing like uh, desktop Dragon publishing. And dungeon. Yeah, it was, you know, you could go to your local local Kinko's and shit out 20 or 30 pages. And uh, Kickstarter kind of revived it the last couple of years with the Zine Quest event they're doing in August of this year. They've done it for a couple of years. They're and, going and for it's... twice a year now on that, aren't they? Uh, I think so. It's been really big, you know, because it's a zine is a perfect, hey, Leo, how are you going to do? Lauren is stellar in coaching writers. Well, they love you in the comments, Lauren. Um, <laughs> Yeah, the idea is sort of analogous to short stories. It's a concise vision. I want my game to do this. You're not trying to, you know, be a universal system that can do Regency romance as well as military science fiction, as well as, you know, cowboys. You're just trying to tell, you know, one, pick your flavor and stick with it, you know, do a tight, you know, piece of art conceived around that. And so anyway, that's kind of the idea about Z. And so, yeah, for Blaster Bolts, we kind of do goofy retro sci-fi Western, and that's that's the vibe we kind of stick with it we'll make a few exceptions here and there if you know i need, I need goofy retro and sci-fi but i'll take any you know goofy sci-fi west ah, there's numbers in there sorry i'm getting confused but <laughs> like i well it's a doom story not western at all but it's definitely goofy and retro so i will go with that that's um, a really good point to make though is you know be clear and concise not just in your writing but also in the message and in the image that you are portraying to your potential audience because if they have to guess at what it is that you're offering you've already lost them yeah yeah well, that's kind of uh the pressure of short writing is mm. you know i you don't have a lot of words you can't you know dance a lot dance around do a lot of word building and win them over gradually you got to I don't want to say pitch them quick, but you got to draw them in quickly with some kind of fun opener or engaging opener. And then once they're along for the ride, you can, uh, you know, filter in those details here and there. But um, like I say, it's, I, I read a lot, mainly stuff you guys are doing, but, you know, a, a lot of stuff as well and a lot of other things as well. And like I say, I, there used to be a whole lot of different magazines doing short science fiction. And now I just see a few and, 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 and you know, there, there's a few online venues here and there, but just, I really wanted to see some more of that kind of, you know, focused writing. And um, that was one of the inspirations behind Blaster Bolts. So, yeah, the only other easy type that I have seen going around is, um, oh, my gosh, I just had it in my head and I've been saying it over and over. So I wouldn't forget Gravity City. Oh, yeah. almost lost it. Um, as the only other one that I've, you know, in the last years have have heard of so it's definitely what is, what is that um, about um the gravity city uh, archie archie i can't remember his yeah. last name um he he put that one out it was a couple years ago we had him on the show lauren um yes and they mainly do like sci-fi so it's like if you take out your western and like you put in all like the juicy yeah. sci-fi stuff and you know incredible he does art the, yeah okay. incredible artwork yeah. um does all the uh um types of fake ads and whatnot throughout mm -hmm. and 
Um, you know, he'll also do audio, some like audio stuff, video uh, interviews of different things. And so it's kind of like for him, it's kind of like a full magazine experience with, yeah. you know, touches of the technology that we have today. So if you want to go and see a video, you can, you know, go watch a video. You can write, you can read the short story. Um, you know, you can check out all the funny ads. Um, but yeah, so that one's. Oh, yeah. Gravity City Official. Looks like that's his URL. So, oh, cool. That is neat art, art on there. Yeah. The thing about Gravity City and Blaster Bolts is you guys are trying to create something excellent, which takes an enormous amount of time. Um, people don't even understand how much time it is uh, to oh make something for the love. Um, but then how to fund that? That's the, the sticking point. If I was a wiser man, I would have a Kickstarter link I could give to you folks right now. <laughs> Alas, I, I do not. But uh, anyone who buys an issue of Blaster Bolts, and they are $1, actually the 99 cents, you'll get an email from me when we're a couple weeks away from launch saying, hey, check out our Kickstarter. Do you enjoy these books? We're going to send you an anthology. And um, if that's successful, we'll look at doing season two um, in 2023. So that should be coming up uh, sometime this summer. So, so the 294 tag from the 1980s on, on the cover? That that's is inflation? dishonest. That's inflation. Yeah, that's that's, <laughs> that's, that's ret retroactive backwards time traveler inflation. Yeah. It's, it's just ninety nine cents. So. Sweet. Yeah. Although the print copy will probably be fifteen bucks. Who knows? But uh, well, we'd love to hear about your Kickstarter on the Facebook page. So when that's up and running, please, please put it on the page so we can check it out. And well, also, good. we've been talking about how short fiction is one is an exercise in becoming a better writer and really honing mm -hmm. your craft. And we have another exercise coming up. Kayleen, you want to tell us about uh, this short fiction competition we have going on in two weeks? Yes. Uh, week after next on The Writer's Journey, we are bringing on the one, the only Ellen Campbell. And we are going to be reading 50 word flash fiction. We're going to give you a little bit of, of editorial goodness and juicy bits of an entire story. You heard it, 50 words, but we need your subs, please. So please check out the Keystroke Medium Facebook page for more details. Uh, we need those by May 26th at the latest or 27th, 26th? One of those days. May 26th, 27th at the latest um, to get yours in. And we will, uh, I guess I'm reading them and then we're going to give some little tips on them and maybe a longer one, depending on how many we need to go through. We'll think about that, but yeah, definitely get those in. They're super fun and you have to be, as Mike likes, the super tightest of your words. Mm -hmm. Tightest words ever. No lazy words. They all have to be good. They all have to matter. Just eliminate the word that you'll be all set. Oh, that <laughs> was, I swear to God, if I see a pause, I'm going to scream. What if, if someone did pauses 50 words, <laughs> Kaylee, what if someone did the challenge of a 50 word story of gazing and turning and coughing? And if someone did that, it was actually compelling. Oh my goodness. <laughs> then I would, I would give them like a clap of appreciation. What an accomplishment. You know, like I'm sure it's possible. I'm sure it's possible because everything, anything is possible. That's true. I was talking, try with, hard enough. I was talking with no, someone this. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, but pauses for the love of God. I'm so <laughs> sick of hearing characters pause. <laughs> I was talking to somebody this morning and I was like, you know, uh, Ellen Campbell ruined one of my favorite sci-fi trilogies from back when I was younger. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. The heir to the empire trilogy, which was the, uh, took place five years after return of the Jedi kind of reinvigorated star Wars. And I was just like, I love this series. I love Tim Zahn. I love it. And, you know, uh, for a couple of years, I had been listening to Ellen, like, uh, uh, no turning, no breathing, no looking, no, no noticing, no, right. And I, I, after a few years, I started reading it again just like Josh was talking about it the other day. And uh, I started reading it again. This is maybe a year or two ago. And they were listening and looking and breathing and sighing. And I'm like, she looked at him and nodded. He paused yes, yes, before yes. turning and staring out the window. And I'm just like, but, but, but I like this. <laughs> liked, liked. The liked at one point, liked. What are you barking at? But yeah, so uh, yeah, it was, uh, I was like, no, <laughs> not Timothy's on. 
Yeah. Yep. Harry's a really nice guy for what it's worth. I know a lot of folks at medical conventions. Yeah. Uh, I was, I was almost misty eyed when I saw that article, uh, Oh God, what's the guy's name? Um, it's not Jensen Ackles. It's the other guy from uh, Supernatural. Oh, the car wreck? Uh, yeah. So yeah, the the guy with the longer hair. Mm -hmm. He was uh, apparently a huge Timothy Zahn fan, mm -hmm. and I guess Timothy Zahn found out about it, mm -hmm. and they were at the same Comic Con together, uh, and left his booth to go find the guy. And was like, hey, I heard you liked my writing. Here's a signed copy of the, like the new collected edition. And like they hung, apparently, according to the article, they hung around like all day. I was like, that's cool as hell, you know, for not only for the the guy who's a super popular actor to be a fan for a minute, you know, but but have somebody he looks up to take a minute to be like, yeah, I like your stuff too. Let's let's hang out, you know. That that, that oh man, that's like that's awesome. All right. Well, on that note, Walt, Mike, thank you both so much for coming on, mm -hmm. chatting with us about all the possibilities. Beyond, well, uh, one big possibility beyond ebooks, paperbacks, and audio. I mean, who knows this time next year what uh, what sort of things are going to be possible for authors out there. But for right now, there are gamers out there who want your characters and they want your worlds and they want them on their tabletop and they want to play the game. So if you're interested, definitely go check out Mike Lafferty's Blaster Bolts, you know, maybe get a story published in there, get your own little game world going and, you know, sky's the limit. The stars are only so far if you make them that. Anyway, I had something there and I lost it. For <laughs> more and more, <laughs> I'm Kayleen Williams. Be sure to check us, at, check us out the week after next for a 50 word flash fiction bonanza and get in your 50 word submissions if you want to be read live then and with that uh yeah for more reading writing and everything in between right here on keystroke mediums <laughs>